this is a brief presentation about a project that has lived online somewhat under the radar for a number of years now, but have, in my opinion at least, reached a point of maturity where I feel like I can talk about it without wasting too many people's time. In its essence, Arkan is the result of a long search for a low to middle level graphics system intended for a number of graphics and security and human interface and computer vision and overall silly projects. Something like a crossbreed between a display server, a game engine and a real-time multimedia framework. As you can see on the slide, it is completely free and open source, under three clause BSD license with a few scraps of GPL version 2 code intended to be rewritten, replaced or relicensed down the road. Moving on to the underlying idea. The underlying idea was that there seemed to be a lot of overlap between common graphics applications such as display servers and game engines and real-time multimedia processing tools that could perhaps be taken advantage of to create a small, portable, yet comprehensive solution by simply finding that mysterious feature set sweet spot and have the um, last mile from that to any single role be complemented by a decent scripting interface where the actual set of scripts determine which one of these roles it is that should be fulfilled for any specific application. Before taking a peek at the actual solution, first consider some of the special challenges that each of the mentioned applications bring to the table. Starting with the display server, or display manager, or composer, or window manager, or desktop environment. These terms are not, do not refer to exactly the same things, but similar enough, and here we just mash these slightly different roles together into one. Is perhaps the most odd component, as it represents a tremendous legacy and a whole lot of politics, since it mostly deals with other programs being actual producers of content. At the same time, it sits in an incredibly privileged position, as it basically selects or filters what will be allowed to go from your keyboard and mouse and network connections all the way into your brain via your retinas. You take actions based on what you see, and the display server is in a prime position of deciding and manipulating what you see. As an example, think of the login screen that you might have entered some sensitive information about your preferences towards passwords into. How were you certain that the login screen was simply not just some full screen application that happened to look and behave just like the normal screen would have, but at the same time perhaps stored a copy of what you typed and forwarded to some nefarious third party? Well, your display manager knows, or at the very least is in a position of knowing. The game engine, on the other hand, has the fun position of interpreting a cl complex input model that covers multiple devices such as keyboards and gamepads and mice and eye trackers and head trackers and brain machine interfaces, what have you, and project this interpretation onto an avatar while balancing quality of experience factors towards visual fidelity trade-offs versus soft real-time restrictions on how many milliseconds that can be spent deciding where to move and rotate and eventually draw things with the added benefit of all the pain and suffering that graphics accelerators and their respective drivers bring. Lastly, the multimedia processing. Think real-time editing and manipulation of streaming video from a lot of untrusted input sources to a lot of untrusted output destinations, where the data formats all parties agreed upon are insane to impossible to implement correctly, which for some reason also seem to differ between source and destination. Anyhow. Um, this process should also survive connections dropping or lying or becoming slow at unpredictable times. Given these sets of problems, who, I hear you ask, wouldn't want to expose himself to all of this and then some? Well, that beats me, so I sat down by my lonesome for a few thousand hours and started coding. As a side effect, I learned a lot about just how much spare time you actually accumulate for projects like this if you stop watching television and cut down on extraneous things like sleep or the comforting experience of interacting with other human beings. Going through this in a cookbook-style rationale on how the project grew, roughly speaking, first step being the game engine parts. This was relatively easy because I had quite a lot of old experiments lying around from my golden years as an insecure fledgling student, experiments that perhaps could be reworked into only slightly rather than entirely embarrassing code. Skimming through the rough blocks shown in the slide here, input covered keyboards and mice and gamepads, metering meant querying what kind of properties such as position, orientation, things in the game world would have at different points on a virtual timeline. 
networking covered just like connecting and sending and receiving some of this metered data to other computers in order to synchronize state without too large time discrepancies. Real-time graphics was mostly mapping images onto triangles and letting the GPU figure out fancy things like lighting and camera transformations. Audio covered just playing back samples of things exploding uh, along with some streaming background tunes. Storage uh, refers to key value, key value persistence to user settings. And scene graph is just a fancy word for the structure used to determine the order in which things are to be processed. Uh, resource management covered synchronous and asynchronous loading, decoding and freeing of assets for graphics and audio. And lastly, the scripting interface for event-driven manipulation of the game world. In my experience, game engines are rarely software engineering gems, but rather obese and complex victims of a published hard, fast and perhaps working, with emphasis on perhaps these days, mentality where it is a great thing if you can just keep running for a year or two after publishing, because after that only history and subcultures will care. As such, appealing to minority platforms isn't exactly a priority, so the first tactic to distance yourself from that mentality is to split out operating system heavy code into a platform layer and port this platform layer to a selected few, with selected at the time being Windows and OS X and FreeBSD, with me running Linux. For the multimedia part, we need video, audio, encoding, decoding and synchronization, which invariably brings the joy of dealing with the libraries that specialize in this kind of thing. Uh, libraries which are pretty much necessary in order to get anywhere without serious domain-specific expertise, which I had very little here. Lacking other free alternatives at the time, the libraries from the FFmpeg project in its earlier incantations were picked and brought with them a lot of hurt feelings and self-doubt. This self-doubt stems from the large number of fun crashes due to wild and not-so-wild memory corruption that varied with the content being played, time of day and other more subtle variables. Interfaces that made sort of sense one day and was deprecated without a replacement the other. Packaging wars, infighting, whatever you can imagine. The only way out of this was to introduce process separation to the multimedia part so that it could crash and burn repeatedly without bringing the rest of the system down with it. Expanding the feature set to what is needed for desktop environment style work is some kind of uh, terminal support or rather text-based interfaces to like system level things and perhaps a bit surprising at the moment uh, integration towards emulators or its fancier form virtual machines while these tend to have unfortunate piracy-related connotations, they are perfect testing targets for performance and latency trade-offs, as you can't really buffer the future here um, until you're ready to actually handle it, uh, which happens to be the dominating strategy for other media purposes. With that separation, you invariably need process monitoring and control, so add that as well. For the display server role, widen the process control to accept incoming connections or to launch third-party programs with all the knobs and wires already hooked up. Then painfully study how the user kernel interface looks for managing displays and synchronization, power management, AV resource sharing for the selected platforms. And this is truly the stuff of nightmares. Lastly, we add support for nested launching. Reaping the benefits from the platform split means that we now add another platform that reuses the external connection primitives from the previous slide, with the separation interface from step 4, and thus fulfilling the goal of being engine, display server and media processor all in one, and interconnectable in a tree-like structure. To keep focus and improve quality without running into scenarios where you design for the sake of design, it is important to meanwhile define and develop some definitive example applications that are selected in such a way that it will hurt, preferably a lot. Use the experiences gained to take notes on what rough spots are in API design, etc., and, and redesign and refactor aggressively. In the case of Arkan, four major such targets were selected, along with a few proprietary ones that were handed off as consulting gigs, some apparently still used in production environments somewhere. We have Griddle, that was a uh, be-all HTPC, like home theater PC solution, that favored playing with emulators and for that matter real arcade hardware, 
This was in large beca part because of my personal interests in arcade culture and preservation, and I wanted to see some of my collected and dumped PCBs run inside 3D models of the cabinets they belonged to. Then we have AVB, or Arkham Workbench, that was a sort of an exercise in what a normal window manager would require, along with some quite crazy features, with everything wrapped in software developer quality graphics. Then we come to Sensei, which is a research project I've had running inside my head since a period as a mostly failed academic, trying to find a model for how monitoring systems and debugging and reverse engineering and similar fields interact. And lastly we have Durden, which is the desktop environment I feel the need for having, uh, and what I'm currently sort of saying, um, dog fooding, and using for pretty much everything these days. For each of these sub-projects, I'll try and describe a little bit of the functions that were contained and what they've contributed to the project as a whole. Starting with Griddle, a lot of the basic graphics when it came to animation and transitions, and synchronous loading, transformations, scheduling and hierarchies, really got fleshed out, and the same goes for most of the input model in terms of translation tables and calibration and filtering. There were also a lot of experiments in creative ways of borrowing and improving displays from other, let's call it, unwilling processes while modifying the event loop of, of said process, like the short screenshot at the bottom left with a wine session running the World of Warcraft client. Um, maybe mention that no accounts were suspended during these experiments. AVB set the mark for, okay, how much code would it actually take to get a desktop going, with an emphasis on controlled data sharing between different tools. There's a longer video in the YouTube channel that sort of goes through it a bit more, but it's all rather dated. This highlighted some of the core performance problems with the event model and the scene graph. The scene game inheritance, for instance, meant that almost everything visible was initially treated like a skeletal animation, with a hierarchical skeleton of relative transformations using quaternions that were resolved on each input event for something as simple as a window drag action. That might sound like gibberish to many of you, but I'm guessing at least some graphics guys out there are going, okay, what were you thinking? And the answer is that I wasn't. Sensei is a rather big and complex project in its own right, and I can't really make it justice here without going into way too much detail. There are some presentation slides available, but it is a project that takes quite some getting used to. Briefly put, it's about taking external third-party data sources of unknown or untrusted origin, be it files, streams or live process memory, then visualizing and manipulating these data sources in a whole lot of ways in order to figure out what they contain, what parts are useful or harmful, or what has gone wrong in the case of debugging. Durden, then, is the desktop environment focused around keyboard input that I always wanted for Christmas, but never got. It is rather new as a project with everything that entails, but it should have caught up with the competition by now and started to contribute some new things to the scene. Like with Sensei, there is a separate set of slides and demonstration videos available for anyone that is interested. After this journey, this rough list of features emerged as to what's been included in the engine thus far. There is not much point for me in going through these one by one, but rather take a quick glance and see if your wants and needs are covered, and if not, while still being relevant to the roadmap covered in a few slides, get in contact and we'll see what can be done about these possibly missing features. Considering the amount of work involved and ground covered, there are a few hopes and ambitions that sort of answers the rhetorical question as to what this would ideally be used for or bring to the open source world. One is, of course, being a key component for different desktop environments, and with different, I do not mean the big ones like KDE or even GNOME. These environments have pretty much their respective roles, development and limitations carved out for them, but rather for projects that would cater to uncommon ones, like compensating for complex sets of disabilities or trying to figure out how a useful virtual reality desktop should in fact work. 
I'd also almost argue that the security paranoid falls under the disabilities category, but there is so much interesting work left towards coming to terms with secure interface properties, and it would be a shame if Cubes OS remains the sole key figure doing great work in this regard. The other being embedded and specialized graphics applications. Some examples include lightweight computer vision that don't really call for the confusing whole of things like OpenCV to be achieved, user interfaces for lower end electronics integration projects in the lines of miniature SCADA solutions for home automation, and for more research level targets in real time visualization like I'm doing with Sensei. Skipping past the part of the roadmap that covers previous releases, which was included mostly to show a sort of timeline of things, let's look at the more interesting bits, namely what lies ahead. While this is, of course, subject to some change in modification, it roughly reflects what I want to do and where to take the project, assuming of course that I remain healthy, can allocate enough spare time to it, or if other torch carriers appear on the scene. The latest release, 0.5, took a rather long time to push out, as it defined the point where I got the feeling that, okay, all of this might actually turn out to be more serious tool than a toy. The remainder of the year is reserved for cleaning up all the little things that 0.5 inevitably brings up in terms of bugs that fall outside of what I have been able to test on the scraps of hardware I have lying around, and to create a Vulkan renderer backend and patches to integrate with QEMU and KVM. Following that, hopefully in late 2016, early 2017, comes an important round of security work in actually fleshing out sandboxing policies and related techniques, implementing a way for packaging, versioning and protecting script collections, and bringing the existing networking code up to speed. There's plenty of details on this in, in the design slides. With that in place comes the last round of, we can call it real features, in the sense of fixing the audio pipeline that is right now too rigid and amateurish. Um, also doing integration of 9 degrees of freedom sensor fusion style devices, which is sort of a missing piece in the head mount display puzzle right now. Also some improvements to the 3D pipeline, and lastly support for being both a Wayland server and a Wayland client. We'll return to the Wayland thing in the next slide. The last two releases on the timeline that are, in my opinion, a bit dangerous and even counterproductive to interleave with normal feature development is performance and the hardening side to security, hence why they are treated in a sort of waterfall manner rather than iterative due, um, due to the mindset required to approach them yeah, well, correctly. Both tasks also benefit from having the largest base of representative real-world test cases as protection against regressions and as valid data points to optimize against. Before ending this presentation, let's cover the two obvious questions that sadly tends to be brought up today as more of a buzzword-oriented thing rather than being given the reflection and critique they rightly deserve. So the first one is Wayland, which, as mentioned in the timeline, will be supported well, soon enough, but it is lower on my list of priorities than the other things in the sense that, hey, it doesn't fit any of my needs or use cases. There aren't any new or exclusive applications that require it, and I pretty much prefer virtual machines and hammering down good integration and controlled data sharing for getting access to legacy applications, hence why QEMO is a higher priority. That said, most of the heavy lifting that is a prerequisite for Wayland support have been done anyhow when it comes to mapping input devices and managing accelerated graphics and drawing display control and so on. So, What should be mentioned though is that the IPC mechanism shown as uh, SHMIF or Shared Memory Interface, although similar, is not and should not be considered a competing solution. It is not on purpose a protocol, um, but an internal volatile thing meant for specialized applications and data providers that can and will change whenever necessary, with a number of trade-offs that make it unsuitable for the use cases that Wayland tries to address. The second question comes down to Vulkan support. Bear in mind that I have suffered OpenGL since around 1.2 and I became an emotionally dried up husk after the long speak failure. I am not eagerly awaiting the next round in this little Game of Thrones. That said, the way OpenGL is used here, being locked down to the rather ancient version 2.1 due to a strict requirement on supporting open drivers and implementations, with some very specific hack paths for GLES 2 and 3, it's, it's far from optimal of course. And being able to better schedule and control memory allocation and transfers with like proper fencing would be a complex but notable improvement to the current state of affairs. 
In closing, thanks for listening this far. If you are more curious about the project, recall the points of contact that was uh, presented on the first slide. And there are of course more sets of slides, although not as narrated as this one, that go into engine design, scripting and so on, both offline in the Git repository and online on Speaker Deck. Thank you.